Welcome back, everyone. Um, so before we get, begin, uh, we'll just do a small recap of what we covered last week. Um, but with some open and in prayer, please, before that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, time of study. We just pray, Father, that as we get into your word, Father, that uh, your word will minister to us and lead us in this uh, topic, Father. We also pray, Father, that we will be able to retain whatever we're going to learn today and be able to apply it in our daily lives, Father. We pray for a blessing upon all the staff and students, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we'll just do a quick recap of um, what we did last week. We looked at the author of uh, the Gospel of Mark, so uh, John Mark, who um, had accompanied Paul and Silas on their first missionary journey, had then uh, Paul and Barnabas, sorry, and then um, he left them in the middle of that journey. Uh, and so Paul didn't want to take him along on their second journey together. Um, then we see that he became a companion to Peter later on. And so the Gospel of Mark is believed to be primarily Peter's account of Jesus's ministry. Uh, and um, a lot of what we see in Mark uh, is from his recollection, uh, his uh, his recording of what Jesus did and uh, Jesus's life. Uh, so who it was written to? It was written to the Roman Christians. Uh, so uh, much more focus on a Gentile audience than a Jewish audience. Uh, and we see uh, how all of that uh, comes into the way Mark writes the gospel. Um, so less uh, OT, uh, less Old Testament quotations, explanation about some of the Jewish practices and customs he talks about. Um, and then um, also some parables that he chooses not to include in the gospel itself. Uh, why he wrote the book was uh, specifically to a persecuted church. So uh, we see Mark talking a lot about suffering, uh, Jesus' suffering, and then suffering as disciples. So when uh, Mark is talking about Jesus as the Messiah, he uh, closely connects that with Jesus' death and resurrection. Every time uh, uh, Jesus is talking about the fact that he has come uh, as the Messiah, or he's the Son of God. He talks about him going to the, himself going to the cross uh, and connects that also to the disciples' call to take up their cross and follow him. Uh, so that is Mark's focus on Jesus, the suffering servant, and uh, the call of disciples to suffer. So writing to the persecuted church to encourage them that this is uh, what we are called to, but just as Jesus overcame, we will overcome by the power of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, yeah, we see uh, Christ, the tireless servant of God and man, and then uh, we talked about the messianic secret, where uh, Jesus didn't want the fact that he was the Messiah to be revealed Two people uh, because the more and more people knew it, he would get more attention uh, that would come in the way of what he had to do uh, during his ministry on earth. 
and also um, because it would also get him attention from the authorities uh, and he had to finish his ministry before uh, the time of his death so uh, he wanted to focus on doing that work on keeping uh, his focus on the ministry that he was doing without people knowing who he was until uh, it would be revealed after his resurrection um the dating uh, various dates given by uh, various scholars but uh, mostly in the uh, 60s is when mark is believed to be written and uh, then we looked at some of the features of the gospel it's the shortest gospel uh, focus on the divinity of christ and his humanity and a lot of focus on his miracles rather than teaching uh, rather than uh, teaching on eschatology or Jesus' teaching itself. Uh, he teaches a lot more, he talks a lot more about Jesus' miracles. Uh, so we listed the, we looked at the list of all of the miracles. So there's a total of 19 miracles that Mark records. Um, so for a very, for the shortest gospel, he records a lot of miracles. So, you know, then just by the fact uh, that he's recorded so many miracles that the book itself is very very focused on what Jesus did uh, and how what Jesus did proved who he was uh, and proved the heart of God itself for all humanity uh, to free us from uh, sickness from power from the power of Satan uh, to uh, empower us to live in victory over the works of Satan um, and then we looked at, um, I think oh, we did look at this. Okay, questionable on the slow gas, just check. So, yeah, just. Mm. Uh, Sister Gertrude, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we also looked at. Uh, we compared it with other biblical books. So like Isaiah, Mark also presents Jesus as a servant of God. Um, in comparison to Luke and John, whereas Luke and John uh, present Jesus as a victor over, uh, over sin and death. So uh, the cross is a place of victory. Mark and Matthew present him as a victim of suffering. Uh, so they are much more focused on the suffering rather than the victory. Uh, John emphasizes the power of miracles. Uh, so um, John talks about uh, the word of God becoming flesh. And it's a much more theological book, whereas Mark is much more focused on the actual acts, the miracles themselves, and what was accomplished through the miracles. So with that, we will go through an outline of the book of Mark. Um, it's just a summary of everything that Mark covers. Um, wherever possible, uh, or if needed, we can go into the passage and read it. Um, so it begins with the introduction of Jesus as God's obedient servant. Okay, um, so uh, we have, uh, if you can open, so open your Bibles with me and we'll kind of scroll through as we are also looking at this outline. So beginning with Mark, we see um, John the Baptist um, preparing the way. So John the Baptist is preaching, and uh, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah uh, is mentioned here, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John begins this ministry pointing people to Jesus. Uh, we then see the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus is affirmed as being uh, the son of, uh, of God himself in verse 11, which we read um, last week. Uh, and we know about 
Mark's emphasis on Jesus as the Son of God. And then we see right after Jesus' baptism that he is led into the wilderness uh, and he is uh, tempted for 40 days uh, by Satan. So that's just, we have a very brief account of it, just two verses. Right, Mark gives us two verses about Jesus being in the wilderness. No details on the temptation uh, like we see in the other Gospels. Um, then from uh, verses 14, so chapter 1, verses 14 to chapter 9, verse 50, uh, it moves to Jesus as a servant uh, ministering in Galilee. Uh, we see the calling of the first four disciples from verses 14 to 20 of chapter 1. Um, this comes after John is imprisoned. So John is imprisoned and then Jesus begins ministering and he starts to preach about the kingdom. So he uh, goes out to the Sea of Galilee. He calls Simon and Andrew. After that, he calls John and James. Um, and uh, then he goes on uh, to do a few miracles. We have a, a listing of some of the miracles that he does here, uh, healings and exorcisms. And then uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, we see... Uh, where some of the conflict with religious leaders uh, begins, right? So uh, right here in chapter 2, it, it has already begun. So this is why Jesus wanted to keep his ministry uh, or his identity as the Son of God, as the Messiah, a secret uh, because of this uh, opposition that would come up. Uh, but, um, but if we read, I think at the end of Mark 1, yeah, at the end of Mark 1, uh, Jesus healed a man with leprosy and he tells him, don't tell anyone, go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded. Uh, but verse 45 says, instead he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news as a result. Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So uh, the reason why Jesus didn't want it to become public knowledge was because uh, knowing that the crowds would follow him, knowing that the opposition uh, from other uh, religious leaders would begin. So uh, 2, 1 to 3, 6 is um, a lot of miracles that Jesus is doing, clubbed with opposition uh, from... Uh, from other religious leaders. So uh, in the first story, uh, they're questioning how can Jesus forgive sins? In the second story, uh, they are questioning why, uh, why Jesus is eating with sinners and tax collectors after he calls Matthew to follow him. Um, in the next story, they're questioning uh, why he is, uh, why his disciples are taking grains from the field on the Sabbath day? Why are they working on the Sabbath day? Um, and then in Mark three, uh, we uh, see them questioning him because he healed someone on the Sabbath. And the end of Mark chapter three verse six, it says the Pharisees went out, began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Uh, so right here, uh, they've started that plot to kill Jesus. Uh, right in chapter three, uh, after this, Jesus chooses from all of the people who are following him. He chooses the twelve disciples. Uh, chapter three verses seven to nineteen. And then uh, from verse 20 onwards, the conflict with religious leaders continues. Uh, so we see his family questioning him, wondering uh, if he is out of his mind because, uh, because he's not stopping to even eat. Like he's always doing ministry. He's always surrounded by people. Uh, he uh, has no time to rest, no time to eat, and so his family is upset about that. Um, then we see that the teachers 
say that he is casting out demons uh, by the spirit of Beelzebub. And so Jesus responds to that as well. Uh, from Mark 4 onwards, we go to parables of the kingdom. Uh, so we have uh, the sower and the seed, the hidden light, the growing uh, mustard seed. And uh, after that, we have the miracle of the calming of the sea, uh, the miracle of uh, the man being uh, set free from demons, where the demons are sent into the pigs in chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Uh, the healing of Jairus' daughter and the women with the issue of blood in chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Um, then in chapter 6, we see Jesus' rejection at Nazareth. So uh, this is where he goes and he preaches in the synagogue and people are offended uh, because he is one of them. He grew up amongst them and now he's come back and he's preaching to them. And so uh, they are unwilling to accept his ministry uh, then six chapter six verses seven to thirteen we see the sending of the twelve they are sent out to minister uh, to people uh, chapter six verses 14 to 29 uh, the death of John the Baptist uh, this is Herod killing John the Baptist because of his uh, wife Herodias um, and then chapter 6, verse 30 to 44, we have the feeding of the 5,000. Chapter 6, 45 to 52, Jesus walking on water. Uh, 53 to 56, healings, more healings. Um, chapter 7, verses 1 to 23, warning about the Pharisees. And in this chapter, we also see in this same passage where the disciples... Uh, still don't understand Jesus' ministry. So he's just fed the 5,000 and he tells them, uh, he's warning them about the Pharisees, be careful about uh, the Pharisees, the yeast of the Pharisees. And they think he's talking about bread because they have not carried bread. And so he says, do you still not understand? Uh, so we see both that warning about the Pharisees as well as the lack of understanding of the disciples about Jesus' power, uh, Jesus' ability to uh, to do to provide for people. Um, then we see more healings. We see a feeding of the four thousand. Uh, again, a warning about the Pharisees in chapter eight, verses ten to twenty-one. And then uh, followed by that, a heal the healing of the blind man. Uh, so. Uh, this also, the healing of the blind man, we see that gradual opening of the eyes of the blind man, almost like a picture of uh, how Jesus is slowly revealing himself to the disciples. Uh, so the dis uh, here he heals the blind man. The first time the blind man can see the people walking around like trees. And then the second time is when they can act, he can actually see uh, almost like a comparison to where the disciples are. The disciples are still not able to understand uh, what Jesus is doing, his ministry. And uh, they are like that blind man seeing trees walking around. Uh, but it is only with after Jesus' death and resurrection that their eyes are fully opened to who Jesus was and what he uh, what it meant to be the Messiah and what Jesus' uh, final goal as the Messiah was, was to redeem all people from sin. Um, then we see from Galilee, Jesus moves to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, we read about Peter's confession of Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. Uh, this is where Jesus first tells his disciples about uh, him going to the cross. Um, they then see the transfiguration. This is Peter, James, and John go with Jesus. They see him transfigured um, on the mount. And uh, he tells them again, don't tell anyone about this until after the resurrection. So again, they don't understand what he means by resurrection. But uh, it's only post that, that they're allowed to tell people about it. Uh, and when they come back from the transfiguration is when the disciples uh, 
the story about the disciples being unable to heal the boy possessed by a demon. And Jesus says, this one comes out only by prayer. Um, ministry in Galilee. So Jesus goes back to Galilee. We see most of Mark, Jesus is ministering in Galilee. So again, uh, the understanding of the geography of Galilee, who were the people there that Jesus was ministering to is very helpful to understand this book, the book of Mark. Um, Christ's second prediction of his death. Uh, so Mark records this much more than the other Gospels. Jesus telling his disciples about the fact that he's going to die. Um, then uh, the children and the kingdom, uh, chapter 9, verses uh, 33 to 37. Maybe we can just read that, chapter 9, 33 to 37. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. Thank you. So uh, here Jesus is talking about not fighting over greatness in the kingdom. Uh, so just as a child um, was not given much importance in that culture, uh, it's Jesus, Jesus came for the least, right? The people who were least important. Uh, and so that was the attitude that he was calling the disciples to. Um, verses 38 to 41 of chapter 9, he is talking about whoever is ministering in my name, don't stop them. Because if they are ministering in my name, then they can't turn around and then deny who I am. Uh, right? So the disciples had stopped some people from ministering uh, in Jesus' name because they were not one of the 12 disciples. But Jesus said, don't stop them because they were ministering in my name. That's something for us to uh, just think about in ministry as well, uh, to be able to acknowledge the ministry of others, uh, not based on whether they are part of our group or not. Uh, but whether Jesus himself is being glorified in that ministry, uh, whether they're doing whatever they're doing in the name of Jesus. Um, then uh, we see verses 42 to 50. Again, Jesus talking about children. Here he's talking about judgment coming on people who lead children astray. So anyone who uh, causes a child to fall away from God, uh, causes a child to stumble, uh, will be judged severely uh, because they've taken someone who is innocent and they have uh, they have uh, destroyed the faith of that innocent child. And so they are in danger of hell. Um, from here, we move on uh, in chapter 10 to Jesus, the servant, starting to journey to Jerusalem. Uh, so very early on, uh, the book has 16 chapters. So from 10 onwards is this journey to Jerusalem. Um, on the way, he ministers uh, in Perea and Judea. He teaches on divorce. Uh, he teaches on children and the kingdom again. So we see uh, just in these two chapters, children coming up three times, right? So a uh, lot of focus on children in this part of Mark. Uh, and in Mark in general, I think, compared to the Gospels. Uh, then we see the rich young ruler. Um, also a lot of teaching on uh, what, how we can enter the kingdom of God, right? We saw in the previous chapter where he said, you have to be like children. You shouldn't be fighting over who is greatest. And here in the rich young ruler story, he talks about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, but it's only by the grace of God that people are saved and able to enter the kingdom of God. Um, 
And then we see Christ's third prediction of his death here. Uh, again, talking about greatness in the kingdom, verses 35 to 45. And then uh, end, we end that chapter with Jesus's ministry near Jerusalem. Uh, so this is before they reach Jerusalem, uh, Jesus heals a blind man. Uh, this is a really powerful story of someone who persists till Jesus heals him. So this is the story of Bartimaeus. Jesus is passing by and he's crying out to Jesus to heal him. And uh, the disciples, uh, people around him are telling him to be quiet, not to disturb the teacher. But even though they are saying that he cries out even louder until Jesus stops, calls him to him and asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, so persistence, not giving up, even though people were uh, telling him to be quiet, to stop asking Jesus, uh, to not disturb Jesus. Bartimaeus continues to uh, call out to Jesus. And then the result is that he is healed. And uh, what's beautiful in the end of this chapter is that he begins to follow Jesus after that. So he's healed and he starts to follow Jesus, end of chapter 10. Uh, then we move into chapter 11. Jesus enters uh, Jerusalem on uh, on a colt, right? Uh, and then he curses the fig tree. He cleanses the temple. Uh, then there's a lesson on the fig tree, uh, which is a lesson on faith. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, uh, you can move you can say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, then it will be done. Uh, so that's a teaching on faith based on that cursing of the fig tree. Uh, and we see a uh, teaching on forgiveness. Let's just read that. Mark 11, 25 and 26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him then your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. OK, so uh, Jesus is teaching on forgiveness here. Um, again, 27 to 33. Uh, is Jesus' authority being questioned because he has just cleansed the temple, uh, so has offended a lot of people. Uh, so the um, chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders come to him and ask him, by what authority is he doing this? And his response is, whose authority was John the Baptist using when he was ministering was it authority that came from heaven or was it a human authority and their response is what are they respond saying what's it yeah they, they say i don't know right because they don't want to uh choose either of those options uh, and then jesus says then i won't tell you uh, by whose authority i'm doing this um then in chapter 12 we go into the parable of the wicked farmer. Uh, this is Jesus' teaching on the religious leaders. So they recognize that Jesus is uh, talking about them as uh, servants who have been unfaithful in taking care of the field that has been entrusted to them by the owner, by God himself. Uh, and so um, by the end of this story, uh, they are looking for ways to arrest Jesus uh, because they know that he had spoken the parable against them. Uh, verses 13 to 17, there's a question about paying taxes to Caesar. Again, uh, the Pharisees and Herodians are trying to trap Jesus. So they ask, who do we, should we pay taxes to the Roman government? Um, and then verses 18 to 27 is uh, the Sadducees questioning Jesus, asking about uh, resurrection, right? So if a man dies, his wife doesn't have children, she marries the next brother, they don't have children, and he dies, she marries the next brother in the resurrection, whose uh, wife is she? So again, uh, in this chapter, a lot of people who are coming against Jesus, so the Sadducees are not really 
uh, wanting to know an answer, right? They're just uh, trying to prove their own wisdom and trying to uh, see whether Jesus can come up with an answer that uh, can satisfy them. Um, and then Jesus, obviously, at the end of it, says that they don't know the scriptures. Uh, and in the scriptures, it says that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of the living. And so there is a resurrection that we can look forward to uh, based on those passages. So Jesus here, when he's talking about this, is actually talking about the, he's using the Old Testament to talk about resurrection. Uh, which is uh, very interesting, right? We look at the resurrection only based on Jesus' death and resurrection. But right in the Old Testament, we can see the resurrection being pointed to, the hope of resurrection being pointed to uh, right in the Old Testament. Um, and then chapters 11 to 13 is Jesus' servant's ministry in Jerusalem. Uh, so we see 28 to 34, the question about the greatest commandment, uh, verses 35 to 37, question about the son of David. This is where Jesus asks, why, if uh, the Messiah is from the line of David, uh, why does David call him Lord? Right? He asks uh, them this question in verses 35 to 37 uh, of chapter 12. Uh, and then... Uh, 38 to 40, uh, denunciation of the scribes. Uh, so just talking about how they uh, seek honor, they uh, do things for human honor, uh, so not to, not to follow their example. Uh, the end of chapter 12 is the widow's offering, uh, and then in chapter 13 is where Jesus teaches um, uh, on the, he talks about the temple, uh, and then he is in the Mount of Olives, and he uh, starts to teach the disciples. That, and that whole chapter is so. There's just one chapter in Mark where there's extended teaching. The rest of it is uh, much more. You can see just Jesus doing one thing after another, right? Miracles, conversations with people, uh, much more focus on that. Uh, and then chapters 14 to 16, uh, we see the plot to kill Jesus uh, is uh, starting to be made here in chapter 14. Uh, the anointing by Mary with the jar of alabaster. Uh, Judas uh, going to the uh, going to the religious leaders and saying that he will betray Jesus. Um, then we see the Passover and the Lord's Supper uh, that the disciples have together with Jesus. Uh, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then prayer, uh, where Jesus goes to Gethsemane with the disciples and is praying, um, where he's arrested. And then his trial, uh, during his trial, is Peter's denial. Uh, the crucifixion, the burial, and then chapter 16 is... Jesus' resurrection. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of Mark. Uh, so Mark is a very short book, but it is uh, full, like there's no, there's no downtime in Mark. It's just constantly Jesus doing one thing after another. Uh, so it's very, very full of action, uh, full of activity that's going on. Um, the last two things that we look at in Mark, so on Thursday, we'll go into the book of Luke. Uh, if you are able to read Luke before Thursday, please do try and do that. Uh, or read, a, read something, or at least a summary on the book of Luke. Um, so we look at these two aspects of the book of Mark, the disciples. Uh, let's just read Mark 3, 16 to 19. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, 
that is son of sons of thunder andrew philip bartholomew matthew thomas james the son of alphaeus thaddeus simon the canaanite and judas iscariot who also betrayed him and they went into a house thank you can you uh, read um, 13 to 15 as well and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted and they came to him then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and they might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons okay so uh we see uh, the term disciples that was applied to all those who were following Jesus during his time of ministry. But uh, these 12 were the disciples, like the chosen uh, people who Jesus himself had said uh, would be the people who would be with him, uh, who would learn from him and then go out, uh, preach, heal, and drive out demons right so that was their uh, their specific uh, mission that jesus had given them um, so discipleship was a very common practice in the new testament times we'll just read these three passages uh, matthew 9 14 20 to 16 and acts 9 25 Matthew 9.14 Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Um, Matthew 22.16 Matthew 22, 16. And they sent to him the disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. And Acts 9, 25. Acts 9.25, then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. So we see uh, here all kinds of disciples mentioned, right? Uh, Matthew 9.14, uh, we see a group of disciples uh, that, sorry, let me just open Matthew 9.14. Uh, a group of disciples that were following John and they go to question Jesus about fasting. So we have John's disciples, Matthew 22, 16 is the disciples of the Pharisees. Uh, Acts 9.25 are other disciples who joined the 12 disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, so those disciples uh, lowering Paul in the basket. Uh, so discipleship was something that was very... Uh, a common practice in uh, the New Testament times. Um, we don't see it mentioned outside of the Gospel and Acts when it comes to uh, our scriptures itself. Uh, so it was first used to describe all those who are following Jesus, then specifically the 12 disciples. Uh, but then the, those disciples started to be called apostles right so there wasn't much use of the term disciples uh, until uh, again it was uh, revived uh, later on to refer to other christians who were following jesus started to be called disciples that was much later but outside of gos uh, the gospels and acts we don't see that term being used um, and discipleship as a process is uh, very well structured in Mark. So if we read through the book of Mark, you can see how Jesus discipled uh, the, these 12 who were following him, the process of discipleship. Uh, they were with Jesus 
at all times they were learning from jesus that is they were doing ministry with him they were observing the way he was living his life outside of the ministry right so they were not only with him when he was with the crowds they were with him when he was away when nobody was watching him so they saw his life they learned from him they were able to uh, ask him questions they were able to talk about their doubts they were able to bring their weaknesses so jesus is teaching them he is correcting them personally as well when they are uh, fighting over who is the greatest uh, when they are um, when they are asking for a seat uh, with him in heaven uh, all of these things they are able to bring all those things to him and he is able to uh, teach them to correct them uh, to help them understand what it really means uh, to be in the kingdom of god to be living as a servant uh, just like jesus had come as a servant and so um, that was the process of discipleship that was followed there that uh, actually was incredibly effective just for 3 years uh they were able to uh grow so much spiritually that they became the people who led the church after the 3 years who established uh the church so that's something for us to learn i think uh today in the church uh this form of discipleship uh mark is a good place to start uh looking at how can we do discipleship better in the church um so discipleship in those times uh there was a close relationship between the teacher and the person being discipled uh right apart from teaching they were also living together um the disciple was expected not only to uh learn from the teacher but also to live the way the teacher lived that was the goal right they take what the teacher is teaching they start to practice it and they start to uh to follow the example of the teacher to be just like their teacher is uh and then from there to go out and disciple others so each of them was then to have disciples who followed them to uh, pass on the teaching that they had received so that was the process of discipleship uh, that we see in the new testament that jesus uh, practiced with his disciples um another thing that we see in the book of mark is the crucifixion itself um so the crucifixion was first something that was done by the persians before the romans adopted it uh, it was uh a punishment that the persians used uh, the romans then took that and they uh, kind of made their own rules around it so they would never crucify a roman citizen uh, they were only they only crucified slaves and criminals um, and the process of crucifixion was that uh, there would be a stake in the ground right and on the top of the stake there would be another cross bar and the person was being crucified their hands would be fastened to the stake uh, to the cross bar that was on top of the stake uh, and when it was fastened it would be a little bit above their head so they uh, it was kind of raised up above uh, their head that they were fastened to the cross bar uh, as they were raised like that and then uh the stake was in the ground the blood from their body would all go to the lower parts of their body uh because of the way they were positioned on the cross and over uh, a few days as their blood drained from the top of their bodies to the lower part of their bodies the blood stopped going to their heart and to their head and that is that would be the cause of death because the blood would stop circulating uh their, to their heart and head uh so it was a process that happened over a few days and it was a very painful process because death was slow it wasn't something that happened immediately it happened over um over several days of hanging on the cross uh the way that they would hasten death was uh by beating the victim or the criminal or whoever was being crucified before crucifixion and the other way was after crucifixion to break their legs uh those were the ways to make them die a little quicker to uh if there was a lot of pain or if they had not yet 
uh, died, they would do one of those things to uh, kill um, kill the person finally. So this is what is surprising about Jesus's crucifixion was that he died actually very quickly compared to uh, how how people would have died. Usually it would take a few days, right? But in the record of scripture, he's on the cross for about three hours before he uh, dies. Uh, also on the cross, they would have, a, a, it's called a titulus, which would be above the head of the person being crucified. And that would have the crime that the person had committed. So what was it that, why, was, why were they being crucified? Now, all of this was a warning to other people. The crucifixion was done in such a painful and uh, a way that would shame people. Uh, so that other people would be scared. They would not do the same thing the person had done. And the uh, putting the name of the crime on the top would further dissuade other people from looking at that and saying, OK, I will never do this because I don't want to be in this person's place. Um, but how is the crucifixion of Jesus different from these crucifixions? Uh, let's just, we have just a minute or so, if we can quickly read through these passages. Acts 2.23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Thank you. So God's plan and foreknowledge. It was not uh, the plan of the people. Uh, it was not something that they were able to do. It was what God himself had planned and intended. And that's why Jesus was crucified. Uh, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Thank you. So to bring us to God, Jesus was crucified to bring us to God. Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was crucified for our redemption, for the forgiveness of our sins. Ephesians 1.17, or 1.7, sorry. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And Hebrews 10.14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Thank you. So uh, we see here that although the crucifixion was something that was, uh, was done intentionally by the Jewish religious leaders, by the Roman authorities, uh, that it was God's purposes that was fulfilled uh, through when we read the Gospels, when we read the New Testament, uh, that God was fulfilling his purposes. He uh, allowed Jesus to go through this process of suffering that was being used by the Romans. Um, but his, uh, his plans, his purposes were uh, the guiding uh, or the the. Uh, the reason why Jesus went through it. It was not the purposes of man. Uh, and so um, we see that God himself was, uh, was responsible in the fact that God himself allowed this to happen. God intended it for it to happen. Uh, and um, it was God's final uh, will that was done in the crucifixion. So we'll close here. And uh, we'll, I'll see you on Thursday. We'll start with the book of Luke. Thank you all.